Uh, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the first lecture of the webinar series on pre-modern Islamic manuscripts. Uh, my name is uh, Bruno De Nicola. I am the principal investigator of the project No Man's the Manuscripts Landscape, or No Man's Lands, as is the uh, we, we used to call it. Uh, is, this is based in the Institute of Iranian Studies at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Uh, the project is financed by the uh, Wissenschaft Fund of the Republic of Austria as part of the Start a Prize um, of 2019. Uh, in this project, for those who are not familiar with uh, what we're trying to do here, we investigate the mainly production, circulation, and consumption of manuscripts in the Mongol and early Timurid uh, Central Asia and Iran uh, to try to look at new evidence uh, on aspects of transculturation uh, as they might have occurred between nomadic rulers and sedentary subjects. So that's more or less the um, the background of the of the project and within this is that we are doing this uh, series of webinars and lectures um, uh, throughout this year uh, and we are starting today so thank you all for attending we are doing this uh, as a webinar meaning that you will be able to uh, post your questions in the Q&A or also in the chat uh, in your in your zoom app and we will read them uh, to the speaker after uh, his talk and, and also I need to say that I have started a recording of, of this lecture. We will be recording the lecture, but not the Q&A of this presentation. Uh, so today we are honored to have uh, Professor Jasad Bashir uh, opening this lecture series. Uh, we are very happy and very uh, honored by his presence. And I will pass down the floor to my colleague, Dr. Tamin Ahmed, who will give us a brief introduction of Professor Bashir's trajectory before we listen to his lecture. So Tamir, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. So it is my honor and a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Shazad Bashir. Professor Bashir is the Aga Khan Professor of Islamic Humanities at Brown University. His published work to date has focused on the social and intellectual history of Iran, Central Asia, and South Asia from later medieval times to the present day. He's the author of a really wide ranging, numerous uh, number of articles and, and books, uh, treating a fascinating set of topics, including messianism, corporeality, Persian poetry, the grammatical first person, cannibalism, hair, temporality, and far more. I should note that these pieces are never about like just the topics listed above, but generally serve as invitations to rethink far broader structural issues in our thinking and our practices today. To quote one of my uh, old teachers, the thing about Professor Bashir's work is that he is always asking the big questions about life, end quote. So I thought for a little while about how I could best illustrate that point. And I, I think the best way to do so is to give something of a teaser trailer uh, for Professor Bashir's forthcoming project entitled A New Vision of Islamic Pasts and Futures. The project is a, is a very rich and, and critical treatment of different constructions of time in various Islamic materials, uh, covering a, a quite diverse and vast set of sources from all across time and space. Professor Bashir's new vision takes us from the Friday mosque in Isfahan to a Jerusalem in Java, to the pages of a Persian universal history in 19th century Bengal, to the crossings of the transatlantic slave trade, to historical fictions of the Nahda and to so many more contexts. These explorations are all placed in service of Professor Bashir's arguments regarding the prevailing constructions of Islamic history deployed in scholarship today. They are also an absolute pleasure to read as one of the hallmarks of Professor Bashir's work is the joy of his words. As one of Professor Bashir's former students, I want to add uh, to all this just one more comment about his scholarship that with Professor Bashir, I always get the impression that no topic can ever be truly exhausted. He, he has the magical power to perpetually bring a fresh perspective to matters or to shine a light on things in a new angle. Uh, one of the unfortunate things about leaving school is not getting the chance to uh, sit in your prof favorite professor's classrooms uh, anymore, but today I'm fortunate and we're all very fortunate in getting the chance to hear Professor Bashir speak. So today's talk is entitled Apocalyptic Hermeneutics in a Manuscript of Hurufi Literature, focusing on a Persian manuscript from the 17th century. And without any further ado, Professor Bashir, the floor is yours. 
Great, thank you very much, Tanvir, uh, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. And I hope that um, I can live up to at least part of what, what you suggested about my work. And also thank you very much, Bruno, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Um, uh, you know, all things told, I think I would much prefer to be in Vienna, but uh, it is uh, <clears throat> nice to be able to do this um, uh, to an audience that can participate from anywhere in the world. Um, so there, there are benefits to, to, to this format. So um, when um, I got the uh, invitation to do this, um, uh, I kind of had to think about myself and my own trajectory with respect to the question of manuscripts um, and brought to my mind uh, my first experience of actually seeing a manuscript, which is when I gra started graduate school um, and arriving in a, in a graduate seminar with Professor Gerhard Bovling in, in, at Yale. And he handed me this um, printout of a manuscript and said, okay, so this is what we're gonna be reading this semester. I had done some amount of Arabic by that time. And, but I looked at this thing and I had no idea what to do with this. It was unpointed. It was a, a, a Sufi tafsir by Abdurrahman Sulami that he had found the manuscript um, in, in Sarajevo many years earlier. I mean, all the, uh, most of what Arabic I had been studying until that time had been modern Arabic in printed form. And this thing was just absolutely terrifying. And it led to us, um, and then Professor Bilbring's uh, description of what this was, it's like, you have to think of a, a, an Arabic or Islamic manuscript like a big sausage. There's no beginning, no end. It just keeps going on and on, and you have to figure out where to stop, where not to stop, and so on and so forth. So it led to a, a, an utterly eye-opening um, uh, experience of, of trying to understand this thing, to make any sense of it. Also, I mean, certainly at that time, my Arabic was really not that um, expert. So just learning both the manuscript and and the language together was a was a was a memorably painful yet productive experience at the beginning of, of um, when I got into the field. I think since that time, as I have done work on various types of topics, um, dealing with manuscripts has become kind of normative um, because basically that's where the material is. Um, but in a way um, I have, uh, because I was never actually formally trained in dealing with manuscripts, it had to be done essentially learning on the spot and okay, this is the topic you're following. So then here are the manuscripts and then one goes and looks at the manuscripts and so on and so forth. So I have this um, kind of a slightly displaced relationship with, um, with manuscripts in the sense that they're essential, but um, I haven't actually done thought through this systematically. Or I thought through this systematically as I will try to show, but I didn't actually learn in a philological situation or um, in, a, in a very sort of kind of specific kind of way as one might do um, in, in certain types of classes. <clears throat> so what that has done is that it has made me kind of think about um, what is it exactly that manuscripts do at all times um, and how to actually think about a piece of evidence that is presented in manuscript form. Um, and I've tried very much to, um, to make that very question, a new question for every different type of manuscript that, that I look at. So, um, so at least for my purposes, um, the, the kind of displaced positioning with respect to manuscripts has led to a productive uh, relationship with manuscript uh, cultures. So, and that's what I kind of want to talk about uh, today. So I'm gonna start sharing a screen here. Um, um, okay, so um, uh, I will uh, talk about this particular manuscript of Hurufi literature, um, but more generally, I'm interested in what, what I'm calling here the social logic of manuscripts. Um, and the, this, the phrase of social logic of manuscripts is in a way is a kind of borrowing from the work of uh, the European medieval historian Gabriel Spiegel, who talks about the social logic of texts. But I think that uh, in her description or discussion of social logic of texts, manuscripts are very much a part of it. But so I'm kind of separating the question of manuscripts out a little bit for, for present purposes. Now, when I say that, um, my kind of association with this question or, or manuscripts is kind of slightly oblique. 
part of what um, I have found very useful is to think about um, the critical, to adopt a kind of critical history perspective on philology as a science in itself. Um, so um, I had been thinking about these kinds of things in my own work until I came across uh, this work uh, by Bernard Cicciolini in Praise of the Variant, A Critical History of Philology. Um, and it was one of those situations, it's a very short book that was um, published in the late 80s in, in, in French and then translated into English in the late 90s. Um, and so he's interested in thinking about uh, what philology has done, but also what are some of the presumptions that went into the creation of 19th century philology that first um, was exercised very heavily on classical, um, uh, what were considered to be the European classics, Greek and Latin, et cetera, and then was gradually adopted for other fields as well. Um, and he's, um, he's very appreciative of what, how philology actually changed how we deal with manuscripts. But his um, perspective is also that philology actually is connected to certain ideolog ideological systems that were very prevalent in late 19th century Europe. And those things actually got um, uh, kind of encoded into the philology as a science. So, I mean, this statement, as you can see, he's saying philology is a bourgeois paternalist and hygienist system of thought about the family, because the, it's families of manuscripts that are being tracked together, etc. It cherishes filiation, tracks down adulterers, and is afraid of contamination. It is, a, it is thought based on what is wrong, the variant being a form of deviant behavior. It is the basis for a positive methodology. So it's just part of the, the variant being a form of deviant behavior is what, what I found very interesting to think about. Uh, <clears throat> because in the production of, um, of critical editions, uh, tracking down variants um, is obviously the, one of the major issues. So the basic claim that he's making in his work is that um, the, the philology is a positive methodology because the philological outcome presumes that there is an urtext that sits somewhere above and beyond all the different variants that can be found. So all the witnesses are therefore suspect. And it's finding out what, how they relate to each other and finding stemmers and all of these kinds of things that I'm sure we're all familiar with, uh, those of us who work with these things, um, that, that, are, that, that, um, that kind of determine where we end up. And, and his... Um, kind of interest lies in actually, in, as in the title, in praise of the variant. It's the variant that should matter, not so much as to what we, um, what, what, what does the old text that we can find or substantiate and so on and so forth, uh, right? So it's almost like if we look at a traditional edition uh, of, a, of, a, of classical text, or say, or Arabic text or whatever. So he's almost saying that the, the, the stable text that is being projected in the main part of the page is actually not the most interesting thing. It's all the variants that are buried in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the footnotes or in the, uh, or the end notes, which, which are actually preserving the history of why this text mattered and how it is to be understood, et cetera. Um, now, there, there is an efficiency with respect to uh, a standardized text that is actually very important and which makes a lot of our work possible. And so, and if we take that away and if we say that, okay, well, all the variants um, are, are where, where the most interest is uh, in terms of the volume of work required to actually read a text, uh, it becomes almost undoable. So it's not actually trying to take us away from um, the, the value and the, and the significance of establishing uh, standard texts or texts that are easily readable, <clears throat> but it's actually, it's just pointing out the, the significance of the variant um, as, a, as a source of information and a source of understanding. So I found this, uh, this uh, approach to philology uh, very compelling because uh, in a way, as I looked at manuscripts myself, I've always been interested in, in the question of variation, that how is the social world within which a manuscript is produced, encoded within the manuscript itself. And the encoding is not in the text of the, the um, is in a kind of a standardized text that we can, um, uh, that we can take out from comparing multiple manuscripts or if it's only one manuscript that we try to understand it clearly as to what the text is, but it's actually the physical object within which the social world 
is, is encoded. To what degree we can access it varies greatly, and it's not. It's, it depends very much on on what the manuscript is uh, and what it can tell us, doesn't tell us. But often the frustration of actually not being able to tell where this came from and what it's trying to do is in itself is a is um, it, it can be a very productive thing in respect to understanding the. Um, the, the the limits of our own knowledge and also then how do we try to fill in that not uh, those limits of knowledge and so on and so forth right so it's to ultimately my interest has always been in trying to um to imagine the world from, from within which a piece of evidence comes um and so in that way going in deeply into the piece of evidence and um, such as a manuscript um becomes a, a, an attractive uh, place to go so with this um, background in mind, this kind of background perhaps presupposition in mind, um, I'll talk about this one manuscript that when I first came across it, um, I was uh, kind of uh, really taken by it. It helped me greatly in terms of creating a picture of who I thought the Hurufis were, um, what they were up to. And um, over, and, um, and it's one of those things where, where I haven't actually been working on the Hurufis for a long time, but this manuscript itself has stayed with me um, in terms of how to approach something like this. So, so this is partly why I thought I would talk about this because in a way I have not been able to leave this manuscript. And so it says something about uh, my own um, relationship to, to manuscript cultures. Now, this manuscript is in, in the Millet Kutubhanisi in, in, um, in Istanbul. It's part of the Ali Emeri um, collection. So the number is um, Ali Emeri Farsha uh, 993. Uh, it's a Mejmua. As you, and so what you see on the on the screen is um, just a page from the the catalog that uh, Abdul Baki Yulpinar um, put together of Rufi materials uh, um, in the 1960s and 70s. Now, um, as you can see, I've, I've kind of um, put a, a box around this, this particular manuscript, but uh, if you look at the page as a whole, you can see that a lot of Hurufi materials actually are these Mejmuas. Um, so in that way, this is a prototype for the much larger pattern of literature that one finds with the Hurufis. Uh, and that's partly why it was interesting. It's one of the most, um, the one with the most number of parts um, now, furthermore, um, so one of the things is that if it, for a movement we have mostly mejmuas, that in itself is some, saying something about the relationship between the social and the textual, um, because you have essentially a kind of uh, agglutination uh, of materials in mejmuas uh, in order to produce um, certain effects, which I will talk about in the case of this manuscript. Now, one of the other important things about these manuscripts is that the first work in it um, is, has a date, which is 1034. And then the last work, the 20th part, has also a date, which is 1216. The other ones uh, in the middle don't actually have dates, but we can tell that they are different hands. Uh, so, so it's actually a text in the, in the object that is available to us uh, is actually put together over a little less than 200 years. Um, so the time um, aspect of it as to how this relates to the production in his history is actually encoded within the manuscript itself. And that was one of the interesting things as well, because that tells us as to how these things were being used, who is adding what. Um, and sometimes what one can have um, in manuscripts like this is that uh, sometimes it can be very easy to see why things were put together uh, in, a, in a particular order because of having uh, topical relationships between different parts. Sometimes we can also see that um, there are texts and then commentaries that are that are coming after. Uh, sometimes the commentaries on the same page as in marginalia. Um, and uh, sometimes also sometimes it can, it can be hard to understand why things are put together. So there's like a contingency and accident and so on. So, uh, and as I'm sure all of all of us who are listening who um, have worked with manuscripts, these are very ordinary aspect of dealing with manuscript uh, materials. Um, and so here, the in interesting thing for me was uh, just that all the different aspects of how a manuscript comes together in time, in space, with relationship to ideology, 
um, with um, the kind of a sense of um, um, building up one thing, building upon the other, etc. All of these aspects of the type of information that a manuscript conveys, um, aside from what actually the text is saying, are instantiated in this manuscript, and that's partly and and because it kind of lays out Rufi theory, that's what made it very attractive for my purpose in trying to understand who Rufi's work. Now, one way to, to do this is, um, as you can see on, on this table of contents, you can list these things out. And when you go to the pages within the catalog, um, uh, so over eight pages, Yolka Narla um, gives us details where the text begins, where it ends and so on. Um, and, and now when I read that kind of information, um, it, it helps to, to see the dates uh, that, that he deciphered and, and, and tells us uh, where they were. And if one knows what the texts are, the ones that are identifiable, then also we can have some idea. But one thing that you can see is the number of question marks. So a lot of these things are actually not traceable or not placeable. Some of these, now that we have more knowledge about Rufi literature, we may be able to identify. But even if we can identify, that's actually not really a terribly interesting um, aspect of what the work is. So reading the catalog entries uh, done by someone who was exceedingly knowledgeable about, about this material was actually not the most helpful thing. When I started reading the thing, that's when I start, came to understand how a worldview, a whole social, an intellectual way of thinking about the world was actually built in um, into what, what I was um, looking at. So that's what I would like to take us through. Uh, uh, and in a way, going away from this kind of a list to a different um, graphic representation of how might, we might see this manuscript. Um, so the contents of this manuscript, um, I came to think of them as building um, building blocks for understanding who, what is it that the Hurufis were up to. So the first three um, um, texts that are there, and I'm leaving out the names and authors, etc. Most of them don't have names and authors, but even the ones that do, that's not really my interest. My interest is to see what exactly is the text trying to do, and then to try to understand the relationships between the texts. So the first three texts are, are about the, the question of letters, um, the huruf itself. So the, 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 the issue that gives the movement its names, uh, the hurufis. Uh, <clears throat> so it talks about um, uh, what letters are, how they're formed. It's, it's the first parts are very much about the physicality of letters and, and how, they, uh, how they relate to each other, why is the alif the first and, and so on. Uh, so it actually lays out a kind of metaphysics um, of, the, of the letters and where they're coming from in fairly vague terms uh, in the idea that well, it's since we have them and since um, they contain uh, ultimate truths, so therefore it's a way of inviting the reader into concentrating on this thing that is really in front of you, which is these shapes and, and the sounds associated with them. So first is the letters themselves. The second one goes into the question of, well, how do letters form words? And how do we think about the relationship between words and meanings? Um, so it goes into issues about what we might call in modern linguistics, the relationship between the signifier and the signified. Um, are those relationships uh, essential or are they accidental? They're very well aware of the fact that different um, words can, uh, in order to actually understand what different sounds mean, one has to know the language beforehand. Um, but then there is a question of, uh, they, they basically turn this question on its head. So it, it's saying that, uh, well, if, in order to understand um, a word, um, uh, that is, if you understand, if you know Arabic, then you will be able to understand that word. Um, and so that they are aware that the relationship between letters and words and their meanings is actually random and it's based upon how language works. But then they turn it around in the third part and say, okay, but ultimately, since the revelation comes in uh, letters, it's actually the letters that contain the essences. So the meaning of a, of a word or a letter or what it conveys or the sound it conveys is actually not in its uh, ordinary linguistic meaning, 
Uh, so if we say the word Beit, it's 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 not that that is house that it means um, in Arabic. Um, it's actually uh, where the ultimate meanings are supposed to be, right? So it's actually very well aware of how language works, and it, but it carefully uh, in between these three three um, treatises, it takes the reader uh, into the question of 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 suggesting that um, that that there's something else that is happening in the letters that that is the ultimate knowledge that is to be gotten from it. Um, okay, so so we have then uh, some sense of what the letters are, and then so the next three works that are attached there <clears throat> go into the question of well, who knows this information, right? Because it cannot be the person who knows the language who can actually understand or explain what these letters mean, because that's the ordinary meaning. Um, so it goes into a theory of authority uh, and talks about. Um, the, the possessor of the uh, of the of the book um, uh, and and then because kitab is actually synonymous with with letters as far as they're concerned um, and so it talks generally about that phrase and its usage in various places then it goes to the 12 imams <clears throat> as being and the people in whom was invested this special knowledge um, um, and then it talks about how, what that knowledge is, is actually the knowledge of the traffic between what is apparent and what is hidden, right? Because what is apparent is the ordinary language, linguistic meanings of these letters and words. Um, what is hidden is this higher meaning and the authority of these figures who, uh, who possess the book um, is to actually um, decipher between those two levels and, and the theorization of uh, why is it that these people are, are um, should be seen as that and a lot of traditional evidence provided uh, that is coming from various types of theological sources, et cetera. But, no, but, but between the two, um, you can see a very sophisticated kind of program that is happening. And there is a science and then one has to say, well, who decides what is the, how that science is to be implemented um, Okay, so after that, um, there is a, a work um, on the explanation for God's names. Uh, now, again, so the issue being that if the letters are important and the words that form from the letters are important, then the ultimate words are God's names. Uh, this again is long history in Islamic theology for this kind of an appreciation. Um, <clears throat> goes through all the standardized names of God and, and, and actually breaks them apart in various ways, citing the authorities that they've already established in the previous works to, um, to explain um, what this means. And then it comes to Fazl al um, as the possessor of all of this knowledge um, and the seal of awliya of, of the saints. So in a way, um, the, the world this knowledge in the case of the 12 Imams, the Prophet, the Quran, etc., has all been building up to uh, Fazlullah Astarabadi's own revelation in the 14th century. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, one of the interesting things again is that it's, it's Fazlullah's um, revelation is central to their whole system, but they've made a point of coming to it through this um, sophisticated way um, until it comes. Now, the name part becomes again inter very interesting because um, the word, the name, the ultimate name of God, Allah, is actually part of Fazlullah's name, uh, right? So this, that's what they're trying to do here. They have all the different names provided. And then the ultimate name is Allah. And then Fazlullah contains that name. And in, in their profession of faith, for example, they, they would say, no, la ilaha illallah, but la ilaha fadlallah. Uh, and but understood not in a very, uh, not in a crass corporeal way, but the knowledge of that was claimed for, for Fazlullah was actually embedded within his name was the idea. And that was all connected to this theorization of letters. So after this has been established, then the next um, six um, parts that come, essentially establish the cosmology, um, uh, which is then reliant very heavily on Fazlullah's um, various works and those of his uh, immediate disciples, et cetera. So it talks about 
how it is that the that the human body is actually made of letters the letters are made of human body and the correspondence theory between the human body and letters which i discussed in some detail in my own work and others have done as well is provided um then it also connects to a different aspect of thinking about the cosmos which is that the the world consists of god's mercy and glory and how the letters are connected to it um, then it talks about God's essence and how the letters are connected there. The four revealed books uh, um, ending up with the Quran and how um, they are actually the same thing as the four elements that make up the world. So the Quran is, for example, uh, comparable to the earth. And then a very complicated com um, theory about how these four, the, the number four is actually connecting the physicalized world we might experience and the intellectual world that we apprehend through apprehending languages provided uh, the cosmological statements from Astarabadi's Javidon Name that are discussed. <clears throat> and then number 14 is very interesting because it's, it's then now further diversifies the thing. So, so far we've been talking about uh, various types of correspondences um, and there's a general differentiation between the apparent and the hidden and then it goes into this idea that well everything has actually seven levels of appearance and, and hiddenness um, and in both cases and it, it has a correspondence between the Quran as the ultimate text and the human body as the ultimate object uh, and how they're completely connected and they take it very literally so the, the skin of the human body uh, is comparable to the um, to the to the, the cover um, the um, of the of the text and the using the word jild in both cases um and then a very elaborate theory about how these things are actually connected how they're produced um uh, how a human being is born and and uh, yeah I, i'm not going to go into the details but there's a this very dense cosmology um that comes up now and after that comes um, Astarabadi's will and last testament. So Astarabadi was executed by Timurids um, in 1394. Um, and so his execution itself um, was made into a cosmic, um, it, it had to be understood as a cosmic event as to because if he has all this knowledge and then he's executed, then the execution itself must have um, a great cosmic meaning. And so they present uh, what is described as uh, Astarabadi's uh, will and last testament, who gets what, what why was he here, etc. Um, so a lot of the cosmology is built into the will, but the will is also looking towards the future uh, already um, with the presumption that he knew that he, would, he was going to be killed. Um, and then we have um, Astarabadi's major successors and their names given. So we have cosmology in a way put into history. Uh, and the history that is con continuing on to the point of when the manuscript is being produced, and what, at least when these two things are attached to the to the um, to, to the object, um, and eventually, then we they are, then they go into other. The last three tracks are are various types of precise treatments of of various types of didactism, etc. Now, ultimately, um, the interesting part um, is for me is the is this. The, what I've done is do, do this kind of color coding. Uh, there is a kind of serialization from the basics of the science of letters all the way to advanced teachings. Um, and this pattern that I found in this uh, manuscript uh, was absolutely critical and, and crucial for me to actually make any sense of the Hurufis. Um, and so my own narrative of who they are and what they were doing Essentially, the information came from the form of this manuscript, uh, uh, more so than one might say from, if I had just read these pieces um, apart from each other. One could get it from there, but the fact that these things had actually been put together, and that this had um, accumulated over time, by the, by the time the last ones are being produced, uh, we're in the 13th century. So the fact that this was a living thing, long, um, uh, was uh, that that was um, an object um, that of course itself is not a living thing that it was a part of living environments and li changing living environments um, from the time of Fazl Rastavadi himself to the time of his um, his death to his successors and so on all the way into the 
in the Bektashi milieu in which the manuscript was produced, uh, <clears throat> it allowed me to actually socialize um, the, the, the memory of, to think socially about um, a, a group for, for whom we actually have very little social information. Uh, <clears throat> there are incidental mentions here and there in various types of works, but because this is not an elite work and Asarabadi was killed and actually, some of his successors were persecuted, et cetera. So we don't actually have a tremendous amount of social mention of it. Uh, so this is partly why um, the manuscripts like this and other manuscripts that I looked at became a very important aspect of, of trying to uh, create a, a story about who these, uh, who these people were. So um, now one of my contentions in my work is that, that this kind of reading of manuscripts that, that that I've tried to do is actually very specific, that this cannot be applied or can be presumed about all manuscripts or any other manuscript. So in a way, the theory of what a manuscript is doing um, has to be extracted from the type of material it is um, and what it is trying to accomplish. So I'm, I'm resistant to the idea that we can theorize manuscripts. I'm more interested in the idea that, that we, ex we think with the, the object that objects that we find. So I'm going to briefly go into some other things that I've done where also manuscripts are very significant without going into great detail of a, a single manuscript. Uh, so I did a lot of work with Sufi hagiographical texts. Um, and so there the manuscripts actually work completely differently or, or quite differently from what I've just talked about with respect to the Hurufis. And I, what I was trying to do is to understand how Sufi uh, social communities were formed in the 14th and 15th centuries and what how can we can extract a social world out of them. Now, in that case too, the, the, uh, the first um, place of contact that a modern reader has um, is the manuscripts. Uh, in, in some cases we have editions, et cetera, but a lot of the materials uh, were in manuscripts. And so dealing with the manuscripts was uh, important. Now, um, what I came to, to think about the way I, when I read through these materials is to make certain types of internal distinctions uh, because of the type of materials that one found, that I found in the hagiographies. Uh, so one is that I made a, tried to make a, at least from, for my understanding, there was a distinction to be made between manuscripts and texts. Uh, now, the distinction has to do here with the fact that um, a single text, let's say a hagiography or say, how the Nakshband or something like that actually exists in multiple textual forms. Um, there's a, and when we look at all the different manuscripts uh, uh, of these texts, there's a lot that is shared, but there's also lots and lots of variants. So the distinction between manuscripts and texts really has to do with this in praise of the variant type of attitude um, that the, rather than trying to reduce the manuscripts into a standard text, if we imagine that the texts that underlie uh, the production of the manuscripts, it actually, the, the interstice between the two levels gives us social information about why is it a certain texts were produced in certain ways uh, uh, that end up to our access to them is through these manuscripts. Now, one of the other things about um, hagiographies uh, as one reads across different communities and different um, forms is that they're exceedingly repetitive. The same stories occur, but they are, they are attributed to different, uh, different characters, different figures, et cetera. Oftentimes they're actually dueling. So sometimes there's a contestation going about on between different groups about who, um, uh, what kind of miracle um, can be attributed to whom and so on. So the social competition uh, is actually, my thought was, is what um, stabilizes this narrative fund that they're actually, um, there's a single um, fund of stories that they're all playing with over this 200 years. Um, but from that fund, different texts are constructed, which then um, end up in the manuscripts uh, that we have. So the differentiation again between making the differentiation between narrative fund and text again help to think about how do stories actually circulate um, and how they go between oral and written forms and so on for this particular social situation, which is of Sufi communities in Iran and Central Asia in the 14th, 15th centuries. 
And ultimately, by one once becomes quite familiar with the different with the narrative front and what the stories are, having read lots and lots of manuscripts, then one comes to understand well what is the genre here. Um, and so, because the, every instantiation of a genre actually, in some measure, breaks the genre. Um, because the genre is an abstraction that stands behind all of this, and one gets to the abstraction by being able to absorb the manuscript text and then understand the narrative funds um, uh, eventually. Now, my 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 view on this is not so much that this is actually a, a strict way of thinking about these materials. This is a kind of a heuristic to make sense of um, what I was coming across and and how to then create a, um, a history, a, a cultural history out of this. Now, one of the interesting things that occurred to me as I was working with this, that the, that the our access, modern readers to this material is in a way the opposite of what was what we can imagine to be happening in the case of the people who produce these manuscripts. From the producer side, you can't actually write the ultimate manuscripts that we can uh, we can see today without actually an awareness of the genre. Uh, so people are aware of the genre, they are learned in these materials before, um, before they actually become authors that we can read today. Um, so from the producer's side of things, um, the genre is paramount and the genre is actually entirely dependent on the narrative fund. In order for the work to be understood at a part of the genre, the author actually has to know what the, are the limits and parameters of the narrative fund um, from which come the text and then eventually the manuscripts. So here too, by breaking these things apart into, into these four different levels, um, it kind of allowed me to think about my own positionality with respect to the material, and also to think about um, what is the social world, to speculate about what the social world is within which these things were being produced. So thinking about manuscripts, therefore, was absolutely crucial for me to make any kind of a claim about, this, about the social um, aspects of um, of what what I was claiming was happening in in all of these things, so the the textual representations and the projections that are found in the texts um, seemed very heavily connected to the um, to the material forms within which they were going and which are accessible to the to us to this present day. So this is the the kind of kind of where I I kind of understood as the geographical text. Now, most recently, I've been working uh, with respect to history and chronicles uh, and the question of time, as, as Tanvir mentioned. Now, here, the relationship between material form uh, and, um, and the text and manuscript is, again, quite different. And it has to be understood, um, you know, in particular, as forms in different parts of the world, et cetera, in different ways. Uh, so that the, you know, what I've said about the Hurufis and the hagiography actually doesn't apply. And this is what I mean by saying that I'm resistant to the notion of coming at a kind of a generalized theory of all this and actually insisting on very particular attention. So very briefly um, to the, the, the question of authority and, and the social and political that is very important here is um, um, kind of demonstrated in this uh, painting that occurs um, in a manuscript of, um, Juvenis Tarifa Jahan Gushai, a very famous work um, of um, Mongol history. And, and this is a manuscript in the Bibliothèque Nationale that's dated 1290, so very close to the author's death. And, and But here the image is absolutely critical to what actually comes across in the manuscript, in, in, the, in, the, in the work itself. Now, when we look at the um, textual edition of the Tarifa Jahan Gushai, uh, the, they are not, of course, representing or presenting this one particular image as the beginning of it. But the fact that the manuscript has this image gives us uh, a kind of way to think about a, a key to how to even understand what is going to come in the text. Now, in this case, part of the image is understandable. So the person in blue is um, Atamalek himself as the author who's writing into a book. And then we have this other figure standing who's unnamed, um, but who we can surmise from the context to be a Mongol royal patron who is talking. And then um, uh, Atamalik is written, writing. So the relationship between the two figures, the two human figures, um, 
is actually represents what is in the text. Um, the historian um, is observer of what went down in the world that he was uh, looking at, but it's actually an employee uh, of, of the rulers. Uh, and so this tension that we find in, in uh, Giovanni's own work with respect to what is happening and how to understand it, how to justify it and so on, is actually encapsulated in this um, dyadic representation that occurs in the very beginning. But the manuscripts history doesn't end there. Then we have this, um, um, this uh, kind of rubbing out of the features of one of the characters. The manuscript remains um, as, a, as a live text and, and why this is that this happened, we can think about, et cetera. There are other elements of this uh, image that are not fully understandable, um, that are not very easy to, to, to figure out. And so there is a lot of information that is provided through this image in the manuscript that is lost when we just go simply to creating a, um, a you know, a, a critical edition. And so this is again going to this point is that the variation, the fact that this manuscript has it, other manuscripts have other types of images, etc., cetera, um, contains a tremendous amount of information about how to understand these objects and, and, and uh, as, as parts of um, social worlds. So, um, I'm just going to um, end with this, um, just uh, to, uh, with the hope that the, the, the point that I'm trying to make has uh, come across and, and just putting this kind of animation on it. Again, the, 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 these, uh, by paying attention to these issues, uh, um, one of the things that at least happens for me is that one um, comes to appreciate the fact of movement within static objects. Um, when we come across a manuscript in a library or in a facsimile, you know, it's 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 a it's something that that uh, that's an object for us, uh, and we are the ones who are moving with respect to it. Um, but by paying attention to the, the, the variation and all kinds of other things that are happening in there, we can kind of appreciate the worlds that produce these things um, also in, in, in motion. Um, so even if one thinks about, um, from my understanding, the, the image of Giovanni actually listening to this Mongol um, uh, figure, and so it made me think, am I like Giovanni here when, when I read his works and he's like this person telling me this, where the, how are the truth claims being constructed? Who is given authority? Who is not given authority? Who gets to give authority? And all of these issues that pertain to Giovanni's own work also actually pertain very much to the work that we do. And so the, the paratextual and other types of information that is in manuscripts allows the, for my purposes, the thinking about these, these types of uh, and change and as the fact, as the biggest fact, rather than something that we can actually map um, by looking at various types of materials. Okay, so I will uh, stop with this and hope that you, um, to hear from you in terms of questions, comments, um, and, and so on.